Good evening and welcome to St. Luke's Episcopal Church. Uh, my name is John Manel. I have had the pleasure of as serving as the rector here for the last 12 years or so. Uh, we like to say that we are a joy-filled, Christ-centered community, and that means that you are welcome here. Uh, while we follow Jesus, we part of what we do is also honoring the other faith journeys that other people are on and, and respecting and loving that is an important part of who we are and what we do. And what we're doing tonight is part of what we do because we are really all about feeding people. Uh, each Sunday, I prepare a meal at that table behind me that everybody is welcome to. It's a meal that's filled with God's grace. It doesn't taste nearly as good as anything Lydia prepares. <laughs> but it will feed your soul. Uh, then, then we are also, our biggest ministry here is Tony's Kitchen. And I'm so grateful to so many of you who, who have contributed, supported, and brought food, food for us. But that is a huge part of what we do. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Ann Vernon, the Executive Director of Tony's Kitchen, to say a few words. other community institutions, parks, programs that keep us bouncing um, and keep nurturing our mental health. We're going to have a community meal. We're going to have readings with the library. Fantastic. We're going to have uh, music. We're going to have yoga. We're going to have art exhibits. This space, in fact, the sanctuary, is going to be a, an immersive experience during the whole week. So we're very excited. And my little shtick, John, is going to help me. I'll help with the shtick. Because my Claire Bounce is about keeping ourselves going and stretching and being resilient. So put your hands up. <laughs> These balls stretch and they bounce. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce Peter Coyle, the director of our library. I'm trying to do 
fingers with, with one hand. Um, thank you all for coming um, this evening for our open book, Open Mind event, and thanks for our friends here at St. Luke's for hosting us. Um, something that Ann did talk about that the Tony's Kitchen does for the library is provide free meals to kids at the library during the summer and other school breaks, like uh, winter break. Um, and so we're able to feed children to come to the library who may not otherwise have food during um, the time that school's not in session. So we are very appreciative and thankful for the, the work that they do with that. Um, our Open Book Open Mind series is funded through the generosity of the Montclair Public Library Foundation through donors, which are people like yourselves. Um, and we've also received grants from the Montclair Foundation and Investors Foundation. Um, these organizations help the Library Foundation raise money to support the library's programs because um, we sometimes need more money than we get from tax dollars. So if you appreciate the programs the library provides, um, we are more than happy to accept any donation that you want to give to the library. Um, and our next Open Book Open Mind event is going to be at another church, not that we don't like St. Luke's, um, but we have to spread the love around a little bit. Um, and so it'll be April 11th, and that will be a Julia Alvarez author of In the Time of Butterflies, and it's the 25th anniversary of the publication of that book. So we're excited to have her come to Montclair to talk about that. Um, and I'll do the introductions for our authors, but before I do, who has a cell phone? Raise your hand. Who has turned off their cell phone? If you have it, or if you think you have it, please let me check. Um, we will have uh, a great conversation, and at the end we'll have questions. Um, I think we'll roll around with the microphone, so just raise your hand at the end. If you have a question, she'll pass you the microphone. Um, and at the end, Lydia will be signing books at the, the rear of the, the um, sanctuary. It's been a while since I've been in <laughs> So let me, let me get to the, the meat of here and, and we'll, uh, we'll let this go. That was a joke. Yes, what's the last one? We had a food joke that was All right, so Lydia Bastianich is here, and she has um, gracious given of her time this evening. And um, she is, if you don't know, an Emmy Award winning television host, best selling cookbook author, restaurateur, and owner of a flourishing food and entertainment business. And to give you a little highlight, she's the author of 11 cookbooks, three children's books, and her biography, which she had received a copy of today. She owns a number of restaurants um, around the country and in the city, and we're thankful that she's here with us this evening. She's going to be in conversation with, with Marissa Bates, who is a Montclair resident, and she is a food writer, but also a trained chef. And so she is going to talk with Lydia about her life and um, other things that we'll find out. But she is in herself a a renowned author and has written for New York Times, Newsweek, Spy Magazine, and other things. She's currently working on a book about the history of technology and innovation in the American kitchen. So we're excited to have them come speak with us. And since I am done, you need to come here and talk anymore. You need to come to hear me. We'll have Lydia come and start the conversation. Give us a moment while we put on our mic. How's that work for you? Can you hear me? No. A little higher. How about me? Can you hear me? No? <laughs> a little higher. I'll, 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 I'll try to adjust here too. How's this? Can you hear me? No. Except you said no. But I think you know what I meant. How about now? No? Yes. Better? You don't really want to hear me, but. Better? She's more important, but can you hear me better? anyway? Is that better? No, no. Me higher. Can you hear my chin? Yes. Can you hear uh, my chin? Yeah. Is that, is that better now? Can you yes. hear me? So I think I think since I'm looking at you, I have to put it on this side. Okay, I'm looking at you. I'll put it on this side. 
This is the entire show, guys. I hope you're enjoying it. <laughs> okay, so now, okay. is, is that better? Is that good? Yes. I'll just talk into hers. It seems to work better. Anyway, Lydia, thank you so much for coming to Montclair. Um, you, your memoir is, uh, to me, I read it. I hope if you haven't read it, you all will read it. Um, you write as beautifully as you cook. And I found the book to be comforting and enlightening and nurturing and inspiring, which I would also say your food is too, you know? Thank you. But here, you've written 11 cookbooks. You've won a daytime Emmy. You are just nominated for another daytime Emmy. You're a proud mother. You're a proud grandmother. You own restaurants almost all over. Why would you write a memoir? How did you find time to write a memoir? <laughs> well, thank you, Marisa. <laughs> thank you all for being here. My pleasure to come. Uh, I have a lot of fans from New Jersey. I know you email me, so it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, the memoir is something, you know, I thought people wanted to know Lydia, her recipes, and the cook, and that was the process. But, you know, uh, be behind that, who made that Lydia, there's a whole life, a life that was very effective in shaping me, who I am. And uh, I would put down, I had, you know, it's not that I kept a daily diary, mm. but you know, little parts, and I knew I wanted my children, my grandchildren to have uh, uh, the, the story, the whole story, even though I took them back and I t walked them through it. Uh, and so when, when uh, I was talking to my editor in the next book, you know, and so on, and uh, the this, this subject of immigrants, which you know, now is certainly a hot subject, came up. Uh, he said, Lydia, this is the time you should, read your, you should write your, your story because you are an immigrant, and I am an immigrant. I came here when I was 12 years old. And you also um, experienced, like, you had to leave Yugoslavia, and you escaped Yugoslavia and went to Trieste and were put into a camp. So that makes it even more well, uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about the history and place that my, my story. So if you're looking at Italy, straight ahead, you're looking at the boot, Italy has 20 regions. And if you look in the northeast corner, now is Friuli, Venezia, Giulia, is now we have, that's where we have a home and the winery, we go there in the summer. So to the north is Austria, to the east now is Slovenia. But Italy extended into what is now Croatia. I was born in Istria, a little peninsula that is on the other side of the border, and it is in Croatia. And Istria and part of Dalmatia were Italian. Italy lost World War II uh, and, and, uh, in 1944, and I was talking to somebody whose, whose uh, father was in the army, the Al Allied forces, stay there from 44 to 43, uh, 47 to, to monitor how are they gonna split the land because of course, Marshal Tito was the newly appointed or elected president uh, or self-appointed of the Yugoslavia and uh, he, wanted, he wanted Trieste, he wanted more of Italy and of course he had to take uh, uh, a, a world decision, shall we say. And in 1947, and I was born in 1947, the Paris Treaty was signed in Paris and in February. And the Paris Treaty delineated the border that is now there, which cut off by Trieste. Trieste remained Italian, and the rest was given to the newly formed communist Yugoslavia. So on the little tip on the peninsula, I was born in, it was then called Pola, it is now called Pula, <laughs> the city. And there was actually 350,000 ethnic Italians that went back. So it was one of the big exodus, and it's not really talked about not much, enough, no. uh, into back into Italy and into the world. Um, uh, my mother was expecting me, and uh, where are they going to go into the world? And then the <clears throat> Iron Curtain went down, and we were caught behind the Iron Curtain. So <clears throat> my formative years were behind the Iron Curtain, in a sense, as Italians, we were not allowed to speak Italian. We were not allowed to go to church. Uh, my mother was a, an elementary school teacher. My father, a mechanic. And uh, my father had two little trucks. But when the communists came, they deemed him a capitalist, took away the truck, put him in, in, in jail mm. for six months. 
And of course, my mother uh, was, was really watched closely because being a teacher, you know, you can indoctrinate the children. So they wanted uh, their doctrine uh, to, be, to be taught to the children. So, so uh, my mother and my father decided to put me and my brother Take me out of, take us out of the city because they were watched. There was the Udba, which was the secret police. I, uh, I remember, you know, taking my father to prison and so on. And they put, uh, they put my brother and I with my grandmother, who was in a small town about three kilometers away from Kula. And uh, that's where uh, kind of uh, I grew up. Uh, but for me, in retrospect, being a child and not knowing the gravity of the situation was a beautiful place. And it was beautiful because grandma, uh, uh, she provided food for the whole family, not just ours. So we had uh, chickens, ducks, rabbits. We had goats. You know, I would milk the goat in the morning. That was breakfast. And you know, you, when you milk uh, anything, there's a nice foam. And I had instant cappuccino in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> and we had two pigs. And I, the pigs we slaughtered every November, and uh, you know made the sausages, made the prosciutto, made the the, the bacon, the fat. Uh, we had uh, olive trees enough to make olive oil for the family. That's also November. Uh, Grandpa had some vines. He made wine. That's in September. And so my brother and I, you know, I was like a little runner for Grandma. Whatever <laughs> she needed, I, you know, when there was the slaughter of the pig, I would bring the hot water. When the uh, she would she would. Uh, kill the chicken to make, to make Sunday meal food. You know, I'd help her with the water, pluck the chicken, and so on down the line. And also the garden. She had this beautiful, what I imagine, beautiful garden with very seasonal products. You know, now uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna go there in uh, right the day after Easter mm. because it's the time. The first thing you do as far as food in spring is forage, forage for the wild. In the wild, the first thing come out. So the wild asparagus, the nettles, uh, the, endi the um, dandelion. So I would go with grandma. And uh, if I can, I go every year in March, end of March, April, mid-April, depend, and go f still forage for those asparagus. And they're still there in the same places. And, and uh, so, you know, working in the garden with grandma, helping her, the potatoes, I remember out of the earth, still warm in mm. my hands. And eating all of those flavors, I remember the, 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 the wonderful aromas of the herbs. We had big rosemary bushes. And uh, Marissa, we as kids, not only did when she needed for her sauce, I would bring a few branches of bay leaves, uh, sage, uh, uh, rosemary, whatever she needed. We would play hide and seek in the bushes. You know, we would hide in the rosemary bushes. And I would smell what like rosemary smell. for two days. And so all of those beautiful things and smells um, remained with me. And then, as you said, you know, um, in 1956, uh, I was nine, uh, my, my parents decided that maybe it was time to move on. So the border went down. We had relatives on the Italian side, too. Trieste, we had relatives, cousins and aunts. And uh, um, all of a sudden, we were going to go see a sick aunt in Aunt Nina was her name, in Trieste. And uh, just my mother, my brother, and I were given the visa. My father was not, because they always kept one member of the family, because if everybody went, they knew that they wouldn't come back. Because even in that time, after the Iron Curtain War was there, many people were escaping. Young people, they would go with, with the little rowboat across from Pula to Venice. You know, it's, it's maybe... Uh, rowing is a lot, but if you go with the, with the hydrofoil, it's maybe an hour, not even. And so, so, you know, people were trying to escape communism, but of course, the borders was, were very well protected. And so, my mother, my brother, and I went to Trieste. Uh, my aunt looked perfectly well to me. She wasn't <laughs> sick, but, you know, what we, we love the Trieste. It was already a sort of a Western city in a mm. way beautiful lights and there were the stores had a little bit more uh, because under communism was a dreary kind of situation. And <clears throat> uh, we, we, we stayed there two weeks after one night, uh, you know, I hear this ruckus, my father appeared. He had escaped 
and that they knew that they were going to do that. He escaped the border on foot by himself. They, they shot at him. They had the, the scent dogs. Uh, he, 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 thank God he made it. And he came from, and I remember when I got up, he was collapsed on the, on, on the floor. But now we were reunited in, in, in Italy. He'd only brought two things with him, right? Um, well, he, he, he bought, he bought a, a, a rock. A rock. A rock, uh, and the rock of, of his East there, his place to have with him, and he brought it to America. And he passed away, and, it, and we, we put that rock under his pillow in the, in, when, when he was buried, so that he had the rock, yeah. You know, there was the, the sentiments that you, mm -hmm. that you have. But in Trieste, our visa expired, and my, fa my father didn't have any visa, didn't have any paper. And if you were caught by the police, they were uh, obliged to repatriate you if you didn't have the proper papers to stay. And that would have been uh, horrible. So my father and mother decided they went to the police uh, two days after he arrived and asked for asylum. In the, we, we were, uh, they, we, they didn't want to go back to communism. Mm -hmm. They wanted to be in the free world. In order to, for them to accept us without papers or anything, even though we were Italians, but we had no papers, they had to, uh, we, we, we were put in, in a refugee camp. Uh, refugee camp, uh, the name is San Saba. It is now a museum, so if you guys go to Trieste, which is a city that deserves, if you were up in Venice, it's a beautiful city, it's very middle European. Um, uh, San Saba is now a museum. And prior to the political refugee camp, it was a Nazi concentration camp. So it had its history, and we were there for two years, closed, closed in there. And we had to, you know, uh, abide by the rules, and they, we were being vetted, and all kinds of. Can Can you give a sense of what it, what what the rooms were like? They were really very makeshift. It was, uh, you know, if you go there now, it was a big entrance, uh, and uh, with, with with a metal door, and there was a whole wall with barbed wires around all of it. And you entered in, and there was always a guard there, and you can only go in and out with, with, with a permit. Hmm. Uh, and uh, there was this big courtyard, uh, a dreary courtyard, and on the left there was this big um, building, brick building, uh, that was with these enormous rooms, and the rooms were separated. Uh, we, we had um, uh, separated by plywood, by... Uh, 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 sh old, sheets. old, old sheets. Whatever you have, uh, there were. There were uh, we we had uh, two bunk beds uh, in our room, and we only had a little fornello, a little to heat up milk or stuff, because we all went. The food was downstairs. We all went online. So you know, you have the little plate, like you see in the in the in the in the reality of of these mm -hmm. refugee situation. Uh, for two years, we went online with my little little plate and waited for my food, and then we had these big tables where, you know, all the immigrants. Now, what was, what was uh, interesting is because Trieste is right on the border of Eastern Europe and Western Europe, and people not only from the East here, the Italians like us, but people from Hungary, from Czechoslovakia, from Albania, they were all trying to escape and get a new life, and everybody was kind of coming through mm -hmm. that. So the camp was quite diverse, you know. Even though if you're on a border, you speak, speak several languages, you know, you have the mother tongue uh, that you speak, Italian, but then, you know, Croatian, you spoke a little bit of because it was Slavian, even a little bit of German, because that area was under the Austrian-Hungarians also for, for sure. a while. So you have this diversity of accepting other ethnicities, but, you know, you have your own. So, but in the camp, there was even beyond that, you know, languages that I didn't understand, mm -hmm. and so people that, you know, you didn't know, so it was everybody kind of was sticking in their own little clannish. Uh, it was, um, it was, it was, it was sad because uh, there were a lot of younger, younger single men, and uh, they would huddle and smoke, and then the night you sort of, they would sing, you know. I guess if they drank a little bit, if they got some wine, they would sing these melancholic songs. Yes, yeah, so I can still, still hear uh, all of all of that. It was people hoping, but not having anywhere to go. 
You, there were some kindnesses that happened to you all along the way in your memoir. Like, and the one that sticks out to me uh, are two that happened to you in Trieste, the Signora Leonori and then the nuns. Yeah. It's, um, uh, yes, you know, I think uh, the beauty of my, certainly of my life, and, and I think that is the beauty of the people along the way that help us and that I am where I am because of the goodness of other people. Because in the camp, we were just awaiting. In Italian, there's a, there's a word, in balia delle onde. So you're with the waves, just wherever the waves take you. Uh, but uh, uh, what happened in the camp was that the Signora Leonori, uh, who, whose husband had a, 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 a cloth, a cloth uh, store and was doing well, had three boys. One of them was uh, autistic, I guess, and she heard that there was a teacher in, in the camp. She came in and, and asked the, the guards if she could hire this teacher that she would like. And so uh, the interviews and whatever, and they allowed my mother to go, and she would go every day to her house to, to teach this, this young child, this young boy, uh, numbers counting, speaking, whatever. And in turn, she, she uh, funded my schooling in the nuns in the convents so I could get out of the, the, uh, the camp mm. every day, go with my mother, and go, go to the convent with the nuns, which, which wasn't too far. So uh, it was uh, a great for my mother because she, she, she had something to do. Yeah. And, uh, and then, then, then my father found a, a, a job through Eleonora to drive, the, to be a driver. So you know, people that, that offered the opportunity to, to, to us as a, me in the school of the nuns was, was great. I loved it, you know, it was a Italian church. Uh, I was kind of the first, the first kind of freedom. Even though grandma secretly would teach me, you know, I knew all the basic prayers, but I wasn't supposed to know. And she would sometimes sneak me in the churches, in the town little churches where nobody would go. But it wasn't a regular, you know, I didn't have a regular, uh, kind of uh, like, instruction yeah. on religious instruction, so that was the first time that I encountered, and in that in that convent, there was the Can Canossiane. Canossiane is a group. It's a, it's a an order that is not known much about, but it was wonderful. And there, there was a nun that took particular interest. She really took me under her wing, and she she taught me all about religion. And um, there, I guess, to to help a little bit to stipend myself, they put me also in the kitchen <laughs> in the morning and I would come out early with my mother uh, before everybody else in the kitchen with the nuns. I was peeling potatoes, whatever I did for grandma. And when, when everybody went home and my mother wasn't finished yet, I would stay there. So, so that was my first kind of big commercial kitchen, you know, these big pots, <laughs> big pots. And what, what, what I really remember was the nuns, the nuns were in their habits. And they had this, this from here to here. That's my this, favorite yeah, detail. This white, they're called manicotti. You know what manicotti is? <laughs> but they called them manicotti. They were white uh, kind of kitchen rags with two rubber bands here, and they would put it over their habit, and they called them the manicotti. So I remember these nuns in their habits. They had a, an apron, and they had their manicotti. <laughs> I can't think of Manicotti again, right, without thinking of the nuns. Um, you were able to finally, uh, you, I mean, so you learned so much from these nuns and the kindness of Signora Leonari, that really uh, provided you with such a different ex experience for being in the camp. And then you finally were able to come to the United States. Did, did you think that was going to happen? Did you want to come to the United States? Well, my parents knew that they would have preferred the first choice was the United States, although Canada and Australia and I think Argentina were offering uh, that. Uh, so, so, you know, I mean, as a child, of course, New York is, you know, you get to, 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 to see New York on television, and we didn't have a television, but uh, my Aunt Nina's husband would go and watch the games or whatever in the bar, and he would buy us an ice cream so we would get a chance to see the news or the television or whatever. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, New York was the... So, so uh, in 1958, Dwight Eisenhower was the president, 
and he opened immigration for people fleeing communism. And we were one of the first family that was brought here. And um, taking care of refugees at that time, the Catholic Relief Services, mm -hmm. which is still doing this, they took care of immigrants internationally. And when we got here, the Catholic Charities and the Red Cross took care of us. Uh, we did not have anybody here. We did not speak a language, so it's not that you know we were welcomed. Uh, a welcoming committee of the family, although they do ask, the first thing they ask, do you have anybody? Later we found out in Pennsylvania that we had, <laughs> but we didn't, we didn't, and so, so we were brought here. So what, what you're saying, uh, Marisa, is that, you know, my story is a continuous uh, story of opportunities mm -hmm. and people that care mm -hmm. and people that kind of shove, that push this along our opportunity and our path. Yeah, and uh, uh, you did come with twenty-five dollars, though, didn't you? <laughs> no, well, well, you know, you know what happened uh, when when um, we were ready to board the plane. Uh, a Red Cross a nurse came uh, and asked my mother that you know she so and so she the teacher, and she said yes, and uh, she said uh, we would we would have uh, a young boy, I think he was four or five months old, and I remember his name was Gianfranco, that is going for adoption in America. Would you carry him and take care of him until you get to New York? And they gave her the $25. She didn't want to take it, but they gave it to her. And so during the trip, which was great because my mother was you know, sad and crying and whatever, so, so, the, so the baby kept her busy. <laughs> and, uh, and that gave us time for my brother and I to go up and down the plane. You know? <laughs> this is, you know, that was the first time on the plane ever. So with Gianfranco, I think about him. Um, you know, I, I wonder, he, he is, so this is in 19, uh, uh, 70, uh, 1968, uh, he would be what, uh, 40, 50, somewhat now. Yeah. yeah. I think about him, where he is, but... I'm hopeful that this memoir brings him out of the I woodwork, hope, you know, I that he'll so. read it and I, he'll be, someone will point it out to him. I your name is Gianfranco, and well, it's going to happen. He was in doctor, so I don't know what he gave him, what name, but he was <laughs> Gianfranco. It's amazing. Um, so you came and they put you in beautiful New Jersey, their first landing place. No, first we got into Oh, no, you hotel. had a hotel. The hotel. Yeah. So they came... Uh, it with, sounded like a nice hotel. Yeah, it was, for us, it was, was vacation time, luxurious, you know? We had, I remember, Chenille Bedsford, we had oh. two rooms, my brother and, my, and myself, one, my parents, another one. We have a tub, uh, hot water, uh, and uh, the elevator. Uh, we, my brother would go up and down the elevator. We, we would play with the elevator. Yeah, that was nice. But we were brought as a, as a group, you know, I remember, uh, yellow buses, I guess, you know, now I know they're school buses, <laughs> came to pick us and they brought us to the Walcott Hotel, I think it was 36 or 38, I still don't remember, but in between 5th and 6th, because on 5th Avenue, there was the Catholic, Relief, the Catholic uh, Charities Office, and that's where we would go to kind of, you know, they would uh, um, uh, talk to us, try to acclimate us and find a home and mm -hmm. a job for my parents and ultimately settle us. And, uh, you know, we, we went for a meeting with the social worker, and the first time we went, um, first we met, you know, in your rooms, and now they were speaking Italian, and uh, come back down in the, ho in the main room, ballroom, and you go to, to the Italian speaking social worker, and, uh, and then um, she took us to the office and explained to us what the procedure. And they would really, they gave X amount of money to my parents to feed us while they would find. So it's not that we ate in the hotel or we were fed. We were given X amount of dollars and they told my parents, there's an Italian deli uh, around the corner and there was Horn and Harder, oh. right at Caddy Corner. And uh, we had a ball in Horn and Harder. I can't imagine. I mean, you know, uh, from, from digging potatoes out of the ground, to opening this five cents, <laughs> but, and magically a nice pie appears. In the <laughs> I, I remember my brother and I, we would stay there and we would wait. Would somebody else come in, you know, could we get two for, for five cents instead of one? But it didn't happen. 
<laughs> and you had Jello for the first time. The first time, one of the, the, there were many things that I tasted the first time, but Jello was one, grapefruit was one of them. And <clears throat> in the beginning, I remember, you know, my mother, uh, uh, our meal consisted of Wonder Bread, milk, and bananas. <laughs> because, you know, that's the deli. She didn't want to go and spend the big money in Horn and Hard. She you know, bring it to the hotel, and, and we, we ate that. Uh, and, you know, I guess she figured milk, bread, and bananas, it's okay. Yeah. But, but the, the social worker got upset with her because she <laughs> said, we need to feed these kids. And so then slowly she, she... But, you know, she kept a record of the money that they would give her every month, and she didn't spend it all. And uh, after a year, uh, uh, we were settled, uh, we went back to see them. And my mother had the total amount, and she had saved the money, and we went to see them. She had the money to say, this is what you gave me, I want to pay you back. Mm. And uh, I recall this as, no, no, no. We want you and your children to become good Americans and to begin your life. This is for you to start your life. And that was, you know, again, you know, it just continuous. With, with the kindness, mm -hmm. yeah. And you, then after, they then took you to North Bergen, New Jersey, and, and you had half a house with a view. Yes, yes, <laughs> North Bergen, New Jersey. They found a job for my father, and he was installing radios in, in Chevrolet cars, new Chevrolet cars. <laughs> he was a mechanic. And the house was on the North Bergen cliffs, now those beautiful house, the, the, the beautiful uh, uh, condominiums or whatever. But we were perched on a cliff, and it was the most beautiful sight, right across from, from uh, 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 the Empire State Building we saw at night, you know, the planes, the boats, everything. Uh, the house on the other half of the side was, was a small ranch house. Uh, uh, we had two bedrooms and the kitchen, although we had, you know, the bedrooms were kind of okay. But the kitchen had a, um, a dirty floor. Surprising. Yeah, but we were okay with it. <laughs> right. We were very good. We had a home. And next to us, there was a father and, and two children. They were Canadian, and I don't know how. But uh, so, you know, my mother spoke a little French then and whatever, but we didn't communicate much. But uh, in, in, that, in that little house, then um, the people came and brought tables, chairs. Mm -hmm. Uh, towels, food, they, they stuffed our cupboards with food. And people kept on coming, the Italian community. And, you know, I still, I think back, and, you know, it, it's, it's almost, you know, you would say, oh, that's not real, but it is. Mm -hmm. It is because I lived it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can't help but um, be grateful uh, for the opportunities that we were given, mm -hmm. and uh, we knew nobody. And so, you know, when I see the situation today that's happening out there, you know, sometimes I know how those people feel. Right. I know how those children feel. And how, because you feel, you know, you don't speak the language, you don't, and the, the family unit, that's why it's, it's meaningful, especially if you have nobody else. You're really tight with the family, with the family unit, and slowly you kind of, uh, the children get into, into, into finding friends in school and so on. So, so uh, you know, um, I, I know that, you know, if these people are given the opportunity that, you know, they would make, they would work to make a life for themselves. And it makes it even more poignant that some of these families are taken, that are split apart from each other, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I couldn't imagine that because, for because I remember when we were in camp, and uh, that you come in and they quarantine you, they separate the women from the men. So my father and my brother were taken away, and I went with my mother in this little kind of dark room. They take everything off of you. Yeah. You know, if there's a child, that's really invasive, and uh, you know they delice you. Whatever they they do, you know, I don't I don't know what I had, but whatever, but. What, what was choking me was that my father and my brother were taken away, and I didn't know if they were gonna come back. Oh. And I, I had this little window, it was a dark, little dark room, it was like, like it must have been a prison cell at some point. 
and uh, we were looking out in the courtyard. I was hoping to see my father. So I know how it is to be to divide the family because that's all you have. Right. Um, on a slightly lighter note, much lighter oh, note. It all ends well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, this has a good ending. Give people and, and a chance, things, right? And things could have good endings. You know, everybody has to yeah, roll up the sleeves and make it happen. Right. And kindness is the. Kindness and gratitude are themes that run very closely, very tightly throughout your memoir. Uh, As a reader of it, I come away thinking, it's, you know, I, I hope everyone takes the same thing I did away from it, which is be kind, you know, and it's the little, it can be the little kindnesses that make a difference to that you. To make a, a whole lot of difference in somebody's life. Like this, the woman who ran the, your mother went to work at the Evan Pacone mm -hmm. factory. She wasn't a seamstress. No. And yet, but every girl, you know, in, in, in Italy knew how to seem. And this, this Italian woman took her under her wing and taught her how to do piece work. And she went, yeah, and, and uh, um, uh, the, 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 the women would come into the house and then brought me uh, to, to, to a school mm -hmm. that was, uh, again, it was, I think, the Sacred Heart School there. It's no longer there. Mm -hmm. Introduced me to their daughter or whatever. So people, you know, make this connection, understand. And it takes, it takes effort, it takes understanding. Sure. Because, uh, you know, if I didn't speak, the one, the one thing that I recall when, when, when we went, when I went to the school was, and uh, I, was, I was still recall because it sort of uh, really grabbed me so much, was that I, I came into the school, and I must have been there two, three days, and you know, you 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 knew you don't speak the language. You feel strange. You you want to connect. And this teacher took one. I guess it was the best one of the best students, and put me out on the steps with the best students. I felt devastated. I felt they didn't want me because I was an immigrant because I didn't speak. The poor teacher thought maybe better to have a one-on-one -on -one for me on the steps with this girl than to just listen to what's going on in the classroom. But I was so devastated oh. because I thought I wasn't wanted. Oh, that's terrible. Um, you had some experiences in supermarkets, I remember from the book. And your mother tried to be a very gracious hostess to a French woman. And how did that turn out? Well, the supermarkets, you know, <laughs> from not having the food, the, here the supermarkets said everything. Uh, but let me tell you, the, the, again, you know, economics, uh, we bought chicken wings and chicken necks was the main uh, uh, soup and then a little salt on those necks, and I still love chicken necks. <laughs> and um, you know, slowly we started to experiment because we couldn't read or understand. At one point, what I think you're trying to say is that my uh, my mother had somebody visiting, and uh, uh, she offered them coffee. The neighbor came, one of these uh, Italian neighbors, and she offered them coffee and the cookies that she had brought, but. The, the, the neighbor wouldn't, didn't want to take it. And I remember, she bought dog cookies. <laughs> <laughs> because it looked, the, thing, the dog looked nice, and she offered her dog cookies. So things like that. <laughs> uh -huh. And the, the woman was very gracious about it, right? Yeah, but yeah. she didn't I mean, need them. No, no, no. no. <laughs> she was gracious to a point. But I remember we tried them after I tried you them. You did? Yeah, it was and okay. It was okay. okay. <laughs> I mean, you know. So like a milk bone to you is a very evocative sort of treat of it. <laughs> yeah. um, eventually you moved, or not so far after, you moved to Astoria. And it began to feel a little more like home to uh, you. It did, because that's when uh, this distant cousin uh, um, that w w we, we, we found. So how that happened was that before we left Italy, we went to say goodbye to some relatives. And uh, this distant uh, relative in La Spezia, in, in, near Genova, uh, her son had uh, 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 jumped ship, if you will, in America, and got married and was in America. And so she said to my mother, this is the address, uh, and uh, you know, if you get a chance, go and see him. So you know, we were in, in New Jersey, we settled and whatever, and then you begin to well, maybe there is this distant cousin that we can find. Maybe we can have somebody here. And I remember, because we didn't have a phone or anything, 
on Sunday morning, it must have been seven o'clock, we left New Jersey. <laughs> Uh, by 8 o'clock, we were in Astoria, knocking on the door of this address, <laughs> and these poor people, you know, in their pajamas, and I was like, who is this? Knocking on Sunday morning. And, uh, you know, first, uh, the, the wife came, uh, Maria, and, uh, and the, the kid, and, and, and uh, uh, I, you can, you know, uh, she, she, I guess she called him, and so he came, and he looked, and then slowly my mother said, your mother, so, so Maria calling. Gave us, gave us your address, and then he was happy too. That okay. he saw us, so he, he he took us in. But uh, yeah, this is this. <laughs> that's another kindness. And he found you an apartment. He did. So he ultimately said, okay, given a few months, he found an ap apartment right on the same hallway across the street, and he he moved us there and uh, uh, a job for my father. And my mother would still go to Jersey to do her job. Yeah. So we started our life in Astoria. In Astoria, it was very nice because it was very ethnic, very Italian immigrants. The Italian Greeks and Germans were in Astoria. So it was, you know, a community that, uh, that was diverse like, like we were. And so you were about 12 at this point? I was 12. 12. And so the part of the story that really stuck out to me was your mother is doing basically a hideous commute from Astoria yeah. to North Bergen or just outside, maybe Secaucus yeah. to wherever the Evan Pacone factory was. And you went to school, your dad went to work, your brother went to school. Your mother didn't get home till late, so somebody had to cook dinner. And yeah. this, is, this is a point for all the parents out there. This may be, you should be the role model for all 12-year-old girls out, and boys out there. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, this is, is, again, that you, you, you know, with grandma, you help, and where you just help, you know, so it wasn't so, so foreign to me. But she did, uh, you know, she would prepare the night before, soak the beans and the potatoes and whatever, and she would write, you know, cook this for one, uh, 30 minutes. That, but by then, I already got the system. And then she would come home, and she would finish the soup, and mm -hmm. it was cooked. She would have put the rice or the, the pasta in there, and we would have a meal. So it was a collaboration. But the one thing, Marissa, that, that we, 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 I got in those the stores was I discovered uh, the packaged uh, cakes, <laughs> Duncan Hine packaged cakes. <laughs> and I love them. All you put is an egg or some butter, and you whip it up, and you get this beautiful cake. So I became an instant baker. I was so proud of myself. Every night we had a cake. <laughs> so there's no shame in boxed mixes, everybody. If Lydia Bastianic can do it, you can do it. Um, you, but you didn't just bake cakes from a box either. You also that you were always you had a very close connection to nature. It, it seems to be to run through your life. You went foraging in Queens. Oh, I did. You know, I, 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 I still do. Out in Long Island. <laughs> I go for mushrooms in the fall. And uh, you know, you go out there foraging, you have your plastic bags. I says, if they ever catch me, <laughs> Lydia the bag lady is gonna be on the front page. But I just get such a thrill out of nature, the gifts of nature that you can have for, but you have to be careful, you know, like the dandelions and all of that, you can't, uh, because now with the cars and, and the, the, and the fumes and all of that, the, the pesticides. So you have to, you have to be careful. But if you go in, in, in a, in a deep forest, in a dip, uh, in, in Long Island, up where I know where it is, and they have, <laughs> and they have uh, horse riding there. And horse manure mm. is great <laughs> for mushrooms. So there's a lot of mushrooms there. And, uh, and the ones that I love to is the Grifoli Fondosa. Grifoli Fondosa is the, um, hen of the woods. Oh, you know, okay. it's beautiful. It looks like a coral, and it's beautiful. And you get them big like this on the trees. It's really nice. But as a child, you were picking dandelions in Astoria yeah. Park. Yeah. Then at that, that, that point, yes. But absolutely. so you could make your family a nice salad. I mean, you didn't just serve soup. You had salad, but, you know, soup, I was you had dessert. Uh, Melissa, what, 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 what I think happened with my relationship to food was that when we went to, to Italy, I didn't know I was not going to go back. Mm -hmm. So I didn't say goodbye to grandma, to my goats, to my friends. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was pulled away from something. And, uh, you know, this, this need that I had for grandma, for the places I longed for, 
came to me through food. Mm -hmm. I began cooking the smells, the aromas that I recall, the rosemary right. that grandma used, the sage, mm -hmm. and all of these. And food became my kind of communicator. Food became my connector. You talk about it as being your umbilical cord, which I thought was is. a beautiful way of saying it. Yeah, it, it, keep, it kept my connection to, to, to grandma, to the place. And so wherever I could, Mm -hmm. bring that sentiment back. I guess still now meat foraging goes back there. Right. And me going back to every spring to wild asparagus, now that I can do it, I go. I have my cousin there. And you know, wild asparagus, the, the, the fern of the wild asparagus is very prickly. So it scratches you and you know, it grows like this. And the, there's the new sper, uh, fern that grows up, that's what the asparagus is. But the wild asparagus is very, very thin. It's like a, like a, a little bit thicker than this, but it's intense, it's bitter. And you have a stick and, and you go, because sometimes in the springtime there's also snakes out there. Mm -hmm. you know, the asparagus likes like a kind of a rocky terrain. Mm. But I know the spots and every year I go, my cousin and I, we go to the spots. And the stick keeps the snakes away? Well, you kind of... First of all, look if there's an asparagus because they come from the bottom up. Right. So sometimes they're covered. You look, and if there is, yeah, you, you kind of bang around a little bit. If there's anything, you should run out. And then you go, and then you go. <laughs> now sometimes I bring my the gloves. Oh, but I, when I was young, I didn't. It was all scratched. But so you have this bounty of wild asparagus. I have to know what do you make? Oh, you have frittata <laughs> with uh, the the common one was frittata with beautiful chicken eggs, but you can make soup. You can uh, boil it and make it a salad with, with eggs or without or with scallions. You can make it a sauce for gnocchi, for any kind of pasta, like you use any green, like broccoli di rapa. Right. You know, but it's intense, it's delicious. Um, well, we need to find some. I mean, New Jersey produces looked, a lot of asparagus, everyone. I looked around, I looked around <laughs> all of them. Whenever I go someplace and it's the time of the year, yeah. I look for asparagus. Okay, let's go. I mean, I want to find some. I haven't some. found them. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but you, um, so you came to America. Here you are. You're a teenager. The teenage years aren't so great just being a teenager, but here you were, a teenage immigrant. How, how awkward was that? <laughs> it, was, it was awkward because at 12 years, you know, uh, your hormones, you, the puberty sits, sets in, and uh, you didn't still speak the language, you're a stranger. But somehow, you know, there's, there's strength. Uh, I guess maybe God or, or the family or belief or this desire mm -hmm. to forge ahead and to make a life and to become part. I know I wanted to be American as soon as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I became 18, that's when you be can become a citizen. As soon as I became 18, I went to take my test and I became a citizen. Because I wanted to make sure that nobody would send me away from here. I wanted to make sure that I, so, so I wanted to, to become as soon as I can. And becoming, uh, entering into a culture is, you know, as, as a teenager, was the music, was, was Elvis Presley, mm -hmm. was, uh, um, uh, who, 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 oh, my goodness, Bobby Darin, and all of those, the music was the, the Bobby Sox, the, this, this, did skirts, you wear poodle skirts? The poodle skirts oh. with the bobby Did you have one? Did you belt, get one? The belt. Yeah, but I had to work for it because my mother wouldn't spend. So that's when I started <laughs> working. Um, but uh, yeah, you wanted to be as 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 quickly as you can immerse in 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 uh, and uh, you know I wanted to be a good student and you know enter that way you mm -hmm. know uh, so so I would study and. Actually, yeah, I became, I think in my junior, I came in seventh grade. In the ninth grade, I was uh, in the Arista, part of the Arista, so, so it was my, um, this, this desire to, to really give the best that you have yeah. so that you are part of this culture and that you are accepted. You, um, you really wanted to, I mean, you've risen to incredible heights now with food, and uh, providing food for others, restaurants. But am I right in thinking you actually wanted to be a doctor originally, or a scientist? I, I like the sciences. Yes, uh, I went to high school and Hunter College, and I was in the sciences. But then the sciences served me 
right in in because food is a science and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I you know there was a, um, a ship named Hope. Do you guys remember? Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a doctor on that ship to take care of children because I was thinking about myself. I guess you know how I was a child, how I needed help, and how mm -hmm. people helped me, and I was going to be. But then I met my husband. You know, that's, what, <laughs> that's what happens. Uh, you fall in love and. Uh, uh, my husband was in the restaurant business. He was also an immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, but he was, in, as we call it, in the front of the house. And um, we had Joe, our first child, and uh, then he wanted to open a restaurant. And that's how we... Now, along the way, uh, you know, I worked in, um, in Astoria at 14. I began at Walken's Bakery with Christopher Walken. His parents, I worked there <laughs> on a weekend as a sales group, but you know, I got into bacon. Then when I was going to college, like the kids today, worked in many of the restaurants, on the, especially on the west side, I would go up there. And uh, uh, you know, as much as you'd work in the front, I would end up in the back mm. cooking because you know, I just felt comfortable, so if somebody needed something. So when my husband said uh, he wants to open a restaurant, I said, okay, you, know, <laughs> you open the restaurant, I had one child, most likely you can have another one, I'll help you. And that's how uh, our be begin it, we began. Now, I loved cooking. I was good at cooking. And, but uh, we bought a little restaurant. It was nine tables in Forest Hills. And we hired an Italian-American chef. Mm -hmm. And so the Italian-American food versus the regional Italian food is quite different. Because those of you that go to Italy know that every region has a, a different kind of food, and here in America is the Italian-American food, which is wonderful, I love it. But it's a different story. It's a mm -hmm. story of the immigrants coming to a new country and cooking with the ingredients that they found. And you know that cooking without the right ingredients makes things different. Mm -hmm. And so um, uh, he was, uh, and we were gonna make what everybody loved, the Italian-American cuisine. I wasn't gonna make polenta right away because <laughs> nobody would come. Uh, uh, but um, I, I decided then that I needed to learn a lot. And I went in the kitchen and became his sous chef. And for 10 years, I worked as a sous chef and we worked uh, uh, together. And I learned about working in the kitchen. Uh, but then slowly I began to insert the dishes, the traditional dishes. And then we kind of, things got uh, a little better. We went back uh, because my husband had his parents. We went back to visit. I visited, I saw grandma again, yeah. and she saw my two children ultimately. And I would go, and we went on vacation. The vacation was seeing the relatives, and then I would go with chefs in different Italian restaurants mm. because I knew I needed to learn all of the Italian because you know I knew the regions where I came from, but I didn't know all of it. Till this day, I go around Italy doing research and working with chefs. Uh, you know, because there's always something to learn. And I mean, nowadays we talk a lot about it being a rare, like it's rare to see a woman heading up a kitchen. When you opened Felidia, it was, well, you were. 10 years after, we opened the first restaurant in 71. 10 years after, and two restaurants, because we were, we were successful, we opened another restaurant. So I went to the other one and the chef remained there. But we decided we were gonna sell and we were gonna go to the city because Already by then we had begun to develop a following and uh, paper, in the newspaper, the, uh, the writers would come and because this little different food that I, I began making, and risotto and polenta and yotta and all of these things. And so when, and this was a good business decision uh, that we, we sold those, made a little profit, they still had a, a lot of lease. And we leveraged that to open Felidia in the big city, which we almost didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> because, yeah, over. I don't think I want to drag her through the heartache of trying to open Felidia again, so you should read it in the memoir. But boy, did you do a lot in a small amount of time. You were covering your own chairs, you were painting the place, you were also coming over up with budget. recipes. You know, yeah. we, we did the budget, but the house needed underpinning that wasn't in the budget. And that's $200,000, and that time was a lot of money and we almost didn't know. Um, obviously, it was a great success. You, I'm being told that maybe we have to get to questions soon, but I have one more question, which is you have 
you could rest on your laurels or your bay leaves or whatever you wish to rest on, but you, and you've written a memoir now. I don't think you're a woman who stops. What's next? I think, you know, um, I had a glorious life, a very, you know, and yes, there were times that life was hard, but I always look back and I said, you know, that's made me, that's what made me who I am, to understand maybe uh, hardship to work hard, to understand how to appreciate and respect and so on down the line. And um, ultimately, you know, I, 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 I got to a good place. I was blessed enough with all the help to get to, to, to a good place. And, and uncomfortable, and you you come to a point where where you you feel I at least feel that I need to do some of the stuff that other people did for me. Mm -hmm. So involved in in a lot of uh, 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 you know needy situation now. I mean I I do work with the, for ten years I worked with United Unifem, the United Nations Female Organization. And that is usually works with, with uh, females, uh, women's mothers in third world countries where we're usually single parent home. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a, 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 an art of maybe sewing or they're sewing. That's how they earn their living. Sure. And sewing, you know, if you do it by hand, you do maybe one a week. So the Unifem would give them these micro loans. Still is, still is. Now Unifem became part of the larger United Nations organization. And um, with this small uh, uh, micro loan, $200, $300, they could buy a sewing machine. Mm. Now they can sew two, three dresses and really go forward. And do you know that more than 90% of those micro loans were returned? It That's was incredible. 90%? It's, yeah, yeah. Those, these women, you know, I'm sure that they have uh, in, in, in plan a system, but so that they could raise others. Um, so, uh, so now, now I, I, I also again with the United Nations work with with um, uh, the United Nations Immigrants uh, Organization, and do you know that each child, an immigrant child that is in camp, loses two years of schooling. So when they are finished, and they hopefully get to a place that they can find and settle their two years behind. And you know that's a major disadvantage. Mm. And so uh, we we do fundraising, uh, a meal with Lydia to build schools in camps, in these camps, so that the children could continue their education and be at least at par when they come out. And but there's a, there's a lot. so to go back to your to your question, yeah, it is this great pleasure of being able to return some of what was given to, to, to me and to my family. And also in, in, as a professional uh, in, within our restaurant, my, my, my family kind of runs the business uh, and that's a great uh, honor for me to be able to work with my children. You know, children, they grow up, you, you nurture them, you teach them, you send them out, hopefully a, a, a good adults mm -hmm. and they're gone. Mine came back. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and there's a story that that was just fun. But, but, but uh, for me, it's, it's a pleasure also in my field to work not only with my children, but to mentor the chefs, the young chefs that come in in mm -hmm. our restaurants. It's, it's, it's great to see a young, enthusiastic person and to be able to impart of them mm -hmm. some knowledge, to leave something with them. Uh, I mean, as I said, I just came back this morning from Boston, and we did a dinner, and the chef Mario there, and um, the dinner was from the book, and he did some of the recipes that through my life. And what did he coach. do? I, I I tried to look it up online, and can we just have a pause while we find out what she ate? Can you? Just no, no, no. <laughs> he, did, he did. There's many things, but some of the things, the the um, octopus salad, the crostata, uh, then he had the pappardelle with the duck sauce. The gnocchi with the duck sauce, the pappardelle with the wild mushrooms, mm. and so on. Things that I, and, and just working with him and leading him through all of those flavors that I remember, whatever, that was even through the phone. And then when I got there uh, yesterday, we went in the kitchen and we tasted it, so I told him what he needed. So it gives me great pleasure to be able to, 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 to uh, 
uh, mentorants kind of steer this, this young, uh, young people in the industry. So uh, what are we doing next is books. So there's a, another, another, of course, continue with the show. Uh, it's been 20 years that I've been on PBS. Uh, and so... I think it's time for some questions. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Um, You've done yeah. um, If you could just talk right into your mic because it's, it's getting a little quiet when you turn your head. Okay. Sorry. This one's not on yet, sorry. <laughs> Sort of. Oh, is now? Okay, oh, great. Good. So if you could please raise your hands if you'd like a question. I'm going to start here and don't be offended that I'm going to try to get you called. Hi. Hi. I watch your show every week. Thank you. Um, so recently I got, oh, I'm looking for some cooking advice here. Um, so recently I got this, I saw a vinegar that was really good. You have yeah, the sweet side. I never really had one. Like that before. Usually it's very tangy, but this one's very sweet and a little fruit, I think. But I'm wondering if you have any ideas like what kind of fruit desserts to Well, um, balsamic vinegar is um, the process of the traditional balsamic vinegar. And uh, it's very expensive if you buy the little bottle of traditional because it takes a long time. But they have wonderful other, like you experience differences of commercial balsamic vinegar. And each one, that one varies in its sweetness and its acidity. And you can manipulate. Now a traditional balsamic vinegar, which costs about $125, a little bottle like that, you don't want to alter. Anytime you pay for a real traditional product, you don't want to alter. You know, uh, you don't want to uh, cook it or add heat to it. But the uh, vinegar, balsamic vinegar, the commercial balsamic vinegar, if you don't like the taste, you can alter it. You can reduce it if you, and put herbs in there, spice and whatever. So if it's too acidic, too loose, you cook it down. If it's too syrupy and too sweet, then I would you can feel free to water it down a little bit, either with a little bit of wine or with a little bit of vinegar. So don't be afraid to put your taste into the balsamic vinegar and adjust it with the heat. You know, you can boil it, reduce it, or whatever. So desserts that go great, and usually if you do a dessert with balsamic vinegar, you want a syrupy one, you want a tight one. It's ice cream, there's strawberries that go extraordinarily well. Good cheese, a piece of grana padano, just drizzle a little bit over it. It goes goes wonderful. Melon, um, <laughs> you know, you can make a nice sundae of ice cream and uh, strawberries and balsamic vinegar and so on and so nuts. So so it's endless with, with balsamic vinegar. But you can just just drizzle it. You don't have to incorporate it in in like if you incorporate it in whipped cream, it's not as effective. If you drizzle it on top, once you put the whipped cream, it's much more effective. Good. I watched every show that you've done that I've possibly find on television, and everything that you do is so well done. But I'm wondering if there's a particular thing that you do that's your favorite, that you enjoy doing the most, and you enjoy eating the most. Um, Food-wise, uh, again, I love the season, so I'm kind of just the season kind of stimulate me. You know, what's not, what's new? What's this? It's just born. It's just so I love the season. But if I were to choose one sector of the the, the Italian culinary repertoire, it would have to be pasta. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> The show that you see, it's 28 minutes long, and we take way beyond that. 
you know, you have to tape and retape, and, and then it's edited, cut down. But on top of that, half a day per show, there's also the B-roll. When you see me out in Italy or whatever, that's all uh, identical. So it's, and it takes about 30 people to do that. Four cameras. So, it, you know, the lights, everything is, is really intense. It's, it's, it's a, lot of, a lot of work. Uh, but uh, it's very, very gratifying uh, uh, because, you know, and then you get recognized with, with, with you know, Emmys or something. You know, yeah. it's, it's really wonderful. And, you know, uh, 20 years on, on PBS, uh, it's been a great, great trip. Now, maybe I should talk about how I got on PBS. Hmm. When, I, when we opened, after I had the two restaurants in Vins and we sold open for Lydia, I became the chef at for Lydia. That's when I really... And that's when I cook really the uh, regional Italian traditional from Italy. So the polentas, the risottos, the yottas, and all of that. One, one day, I uh, get a call, Julia Child makes a reservation. <laughs> so Julia Child and James Beard, you know, they're both big figures, came in for dinner. And she loved the risotto, the mushroom risotto. Uh, they came in thereafter another two, three times, but she asked me to teach her how to make the risotto. Uh, she came to the house. We became friends, and we were friends until the end. Uh, uh, remained friends until the end. And um, at some point, she asked me, Lydia, I would like you to be on my show. Let's do the risotto on my show. So I did two episodes of the Master Chef series with her. And the producer says, you know, Lydia, you're pretty good. How about a show of your own? And that's how it all began. And of course, you know, I wanted to be on PBS. And at that time, not only PBS, I asked for two things. PBS and that we taped the show in my house. And for the first 15 years, the show has, was taped in my house. And that because I wasn't used to a, 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 a studio. I figured in my kitchen, I know it's the temperature, <laughs> the pots, the this. I felt comfortable. But about five years, uh, as you all know, you watch my mother, she's 98. Mm -hmm. she, she lives with me, and it was getting too much for her to have these 30 people and all these cables around. So for the last five years, we've been doing it in a, in a kitchen show. Room. That's a nice name, Luca. He's a little shy. Oh, you sure? You don't want to talk to Luca? <laughs> you like pasta? Huh? What kind of pasta do you like? Uh, spaghetti. <laughs> spaghetti? I like spaghetti too. And what kind, what do you like on it? A little butter and cheese, I bet? That's what he had at your restaurant. All the things. The chef said, I'll make you whatever you want. He said, I just want it with butter and cheese. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's a perfectly delicious pasta. <laughs> Good look at good for you. So when, when, when we first started filming, we did it in my house, and you call, you know, all the production companies, they have a service come in and spread the food and whatever, and, uh, and so we ordered sandwiches and whatever, put it out, <laughs> but you know, I was cooking whatever I cooked, after they started with the sandwiches, I put out what we cooked, that because I cooked in real time, real good, it's not, you know, it's real, the real stuff. So I said, you know, let's put it out with the sandwiches and, and uh, let them enjoy it. So they got wind of it. <laughs> next, next time, 
they waited until, <laughs> until the stuff came out, and then the sandwiches. So by, 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 we figured it out. I said, let them eat our food. I make a little bit of extra, whatever. And when we make the last the night uh, uh, show, we save it in the refrigerator and then reheat it the next day. And so, so it doesn't get wasted. <laughs> And watch. Uh, I think just just wonderful because you know, food is is so real. Uh, and children today are removed from the source of food, from what food. You know, uh, uh, chicken uh, chicken breast is in a the plastic. They don't know that there's a real. And for us to really be conscious about our world and our environment, we need to know. We need to know how things grow. We need to know how to to, to the, the the animals take care of the animals. <clears throat> and ultimately the animals nourish us, you know, a lot of time you get this discussion, oh, don't talk to me about the, a whole chicken. But that's the reality, and unless you know it, and unless you <clears throat> are thankful and respect it. <clears throat> and unless, when that animal, that chicken, is killed because it's going to nourish us, you need to appreciate it and you need to use the whole thing. That's, you know, not just the breasts and whatever. So knowing about uh, food is so important for the children in, in just growing up in the world. Gnocchis. <laughs> to make good gnocchis, you need, you need you know, good starchy potato, Idaho russet. You cook it in their skin. Don't let it. Then you peel it and you rice it. Then you spread it out and let it cool completely. Let the, uh, the vapor all go away, but a little salt. Once it is cooled completely, then you begin to pull it together. You pull it together, you put your, your eggs, your flour, your salt, and you begin to knead. Do not over knead it, because the more you knead it, the more it requires flour, and the heavier it gets. So cool the potatoes, number one. Number two, get, be quick at kneading it. And if it's a little kind of loose and stick, you know, when you're cutting the small pieces, and it's okay. You can add flour as you're rolling it out and cutting it. So don't over knead it and don't put too much flour in it. Thank you so much. Okay. Cooked for a long period of time 
because they are so they're either in minestras or in soups, and ultimately uh, they are also served in, in gelatin, which is a, 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 a very uh, common, I don't know which recipe he wants, but <laughs> like in a soup, soup plate, uh, you, you make a, a soup, a dense gelatin of, of uh, veal and beef and pork, thing. and then you take this, the pork foot, once you get the gelatin, and you put it in a plate, and then you cover it with the soup, and you let it chill, and that's done in the winter time, in a sense, and it becomes the pig's foot in the gelatin. I don't know if you may think of that. Ask me, that's the one. <laughs> Hi, Lydia. Hi. Um, so you're a big part of our family as well. My mom's always watching you. Uh, we always come home, and she's always like, oh, we learned this in uh, our home watching video. She's always so excited about what she's making. Uh, but I was wondering, my question is, uh, what do you have? So are you, are you, are you talking uh, professionally, or are you talking, you just want to get into it and then you'll decide? I'm going to school as a now, so I want to see. You are going to school, good for you. Okay, I think what's important for a good chef is, first of all, you know, there's a lot of talk about gender, women, men. Think about it as a profession. A, you want to be a good professional. So you got to invest in yourself. Educate yourself as much as you can. And not only in the culinary, but in everything else. But make sure that you get into the culinary. And what's important for you is to begin to find mentors and work. You have to get your hands dirty. You have to get your hands in the food. So you have to start cooking, whether you become an assistant or whatever. I don't know what part of your education you are. So get a great education. Look for mentors. Work with people whose, whose work you admire. Begin with, you know, the local pasta, pizza, whatever you want to do, but then work yourself up. And look for those people, and you've got to move around. Traveling is also very important to so understand other cultures, other uh, uh, foods, and all of that. That's how you understand. I don't know, again, do you want to become an American chef, or do you have an ethnic? Uh, uh, that's, you, know, you don't have to answer, but that's, you have to take that. <laughs> in consideration and work towards that goal. Uh, but I can't stress enough that how you need to take pride, invest in yourself, and get as much as you can out of all of the experiences. Go out there, make it happen, and be a true and great professional. Then you go out there, and you do it, you make it happen. It's, don't feel that you're, if you know what you're doing, if you're a good professional, it will show up. Your food will be recognized. Uh, what you have to, ha what has to happen also as a chef is that you have to develop your own profile of what you want to cook, and you do that with time with different people. There's a certain way that you will have that will make you special. Like you know, I have my profile of flavors or whatever. So you have to work. So that's so all of these elements to 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 go. Um, you know, in in our profession is a tough profession. So so you know. Make sure that you respect everybody along the way and make sure that you demand respect. Don't take anything from anybody. Thank you. Last question, okay. What's your second favorite food outside of Italian? What other cuisine? Italian? I love Thai food. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> nice spicy Thai food. <laughs> I don't know how to cook it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, huh? You always cook for free ah, That's as close as I get to Thai. No, no, I, I like. I can come close to the glass noodles. I like. Yeah, that. I know. <laughs> Bit of coconut milk. Yes. Hello, Leah. I just want to thank you for giving me great pride to be an Italian American. Your show is just a marvelous show. Any of us who are the children of Italian immigrants as I am. My name is Bruno, by the way, I'm a retired school teacher. I don't have a food question. I have a personal question. Sure. Um, as, a, as a young woman, uh, it was very difficult for me when I was dating. My parents were very, very strict. My first date, I had to take my brother. <laughs>
Well, the, you know, um, the, 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 the words in Astoria, there was the cluster of immigrants, you know, like the Calabresa stayed together with the Calabresa. The Triestini stayed together with the Triestini. They have their dances, they have their food, they, have, they sing their songs, and they meet the young people in the same, in the same. And I think that gave um, maybe my parents a bit more of a comfort, although, although they were completely against uh, against me because I was I was kind of young. I got married at 21, so so uh, I, you know they uh, they wanted me to go on and finish my original. But you know, love is what it is. So, uh, but no, I I didn't have to take my brother with me. <laughs> But they do in Sicily, you know. They have <laughs> where uh, the, 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 the guy comes and asks for the girl's hand, and the one, they go for a walk, and they walk slowly and talk, not that touch. Behind them is the grandmother or the aunt or whatever, <laughs> walking behind, just to make sure. I don't know. So, so yeah, the tradition is there. Because, uh, you know, there's different kinds of chefs. So there's a chef, the chef that, you know, it's about their personal creativity and what they can invent and what they can uh, uh, do. And that's, they might have some secrets that they do. But I am a chef of a culture. And uh, since, you know, I was Italian and I came to America, I have two homes. And I think food is a way of me bringing together my two, my two homes, my two people. And uh, for me, then, it's about being a conduit of real Italian, my native food, to my adaptive home and family here in America. So it's not about inventing. I haven't invented any recipes. Most of them belong to the patrimony of the Italian culinary arts, uh, I modify them, I doodle different things, and I share those things with you, I think. You know, when I find something works or something, I share it with you. So I don't think I have a secret. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's not me.